I'm Arlene Herson, and tonight I invite you to join me on an adventure into the world of magic and illusion. My guest tonight is a man who spends his days sawing his beautiful wife in half, shooting her out of a cannon, and turning her into a tiger. He also makes light bulbs float, handkerchiefs dance, and audiences gasp as he delights them with fascinating illusions. Whether you call it illusion, magic, or sleight of hand, you have to call him incredibly talented. He is Harry Blackstone, master of his craft, magician, author, actor, who brings magic to audiences worldwide. We will meet Harry Blackstone right after these messages, so please stay right there. Here's one time it doesn't matter who your neighbor is. Here's the other. Life's too short. Stop the hate. That's my dad, and that's mom. Dad's got an idea, a way to get rid of all the grody garbage that's polluting the world. He's invented a big rocket ship to shoot all the garbage into outer space. Mom's not sure, but dad says his invention will save the world. There's an easier way to save the world. Recycle. For your free recycling action guide, write Recycle. Environmental Defense Fund, 257 Park Avenue South, New York, New York. We're back. I'm Arlene Herson, and we're here with my very special guest, Harry Blackstone, in his dressing room at the Trump Plaza Hotel in Atlantic City. Thank you very much for taking time from your busy day to, uh, to be on our it's show. It's been our pleasure, Arlene. We've had a few minutes here in the preparations and all. It's been very exciting to get back into television. <laughs> well, television magic. Actually, magic has been a part of your life, and so is television. But you were practically born into magic. I mean, your I father, was literally born. Literally into born. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. Your father being the, the great Blackstone, your yes. mother one of his assistants. Right. From the age six months, you disappeared on the stage. <laughs> in fact, I appeared. Interesting story. We were working in Chicago, the Oriental Theater. It was late that first year of my, uh, first half of my life. And uh, business was so good, Dad said that they had to add an extra matinee. So instead of doing four a day, they were doing five this one day. Well, somebody forgot to tell the young lady who was my governess to be at the theater early to take charge of me while Mom and Dad were on stage. So Mother said, I can't leave him in the dressing room. He'll get into the makeup or into the wardrobe or fall down the stairs. So she took me inside of an illusion. And it was an illusion where uh, first my father would show this large paper map of the world. And then out of each of the countries, he would pull a flag that was of that country. And then finally, out of the United States would come my mother, dressed as the Statue of Liberty, appropriate for this year. And uh, she was carrying the torch and the, the book. Well, this one particular time, instead of my mother appearing in the normal way, she came out holding a baby bottle and this squalling infant in her arm. I was the infant. And Dad said that when I came out and the laughter and the applause started in the audience, that I stopped crying and that he knew right then when I responded that way to applause and laughter that I'd be in show business. And he's right. I've been chasing them both ever since. Oh, wow. A star was born. <laughs> they do say there's a certain magic in that applause. It really is. It was a part of our early time. I traveled with my father's show until it was required that I go to school. Uh, I was about six years of age at that time, started to go to school out on the West Coast. And each time that the school would take its breaks, it was a boarding school, and everybody would go home for the various holidays, I would join my father's show. So home to me for my first 10 years was really whatever theater my dad and mom happened to be performing at. Home was 
the Oriental Theater in Chicago or the Schubert in Boston or perhaps the uh, Schubert Lafayette in Detroit or the uh, um, we were right here in uh, in Atlantic City a couple of times and we went to uh, uh, Atlanta and New York I can remember each one of these as a specific holiday that's interesting it sounds exciting it sounds wonderful as a matter of fact you join a magic show every yeah. time you're on vacation but however was it really wonderful I mean what was there a it really was illusion. wonderful. Illusion. It really was. As I look back on it now, I realize how very fortunate and, and really kind of uh, close and tight our little family group was. Because even though I'm an only child, I had the advantage of having all of those young people who were the assistants on my father's show as brothers and sisters. And to this day, we still think of ourselves in that way. Some of them more like um, aunts and uncles because there was some uh, difference in our ages. There were no small children on the show, but I had that kind of camaraderie while I was at school. Yet it would be like coming home and finding that the uh, 12 or 14 kids that were working on the show would welcome me and we'd have parties and play games and go to the zoo and do all of those things that kids and families do together. Was it boarding school? Did you live at school? Yes. Mm -hmm. So that that was, I mean, could that have been tough for you? Was that tough for you? Not, Not with tough. Uh, it was lonely, as I think any child that attends a boarding school finds that kind of thing lonely. I was in a small school in, in Hollywood up until the time when uh, we had the unpleasantries happening with Japan. And because there was rumor of the fact that there may be an invasion of the West Coast, my father then removed me from that school, and I went to school at a military school in Atlanta, Georgia, the Georgia Military Academy. And I was there for several years of the war, and then went to Morgan Park Military Academy in Chicago and Culver Military Academy, and finally ended up in a small but very lovely private school in Tucson, Arizona, or just outside of Tucson, called Southern Arizona School for Boys. Had a lot of fun there, and that's where I first began doing magic because the headmaster of the school, whose middle name was Blackstone, no relation, uh, he had a particular interest in magic, had seen my dad perform during his uh, years of traveling. He was a former military man who became then on his retirement the headmaster. And so he encouraged me to look into the history as well as into the practicality of the performing of magic. So I began learning these little tricks and I learned as much through him and through that library and through my personal contacts away from the show as I did up to that point from my dad, because my dad would not sit me down and teach me a trick. Rather, he would allow me to learn it by osmosis, if you will. I'd stand off stage and watch how it was done, and I was always in the way. I was the kid, you know, always underfoot when they were taking the things off the truck, and underfoot when they were hanging the various big illusions and the apparatus, and I was responsible for destroying several pieces of apparatus in my <laughs> young day. Finally, one day, my dad came backstage. He had gone out between shows to do an interview of some sort. He came back, and he found that I was standing on stage behind the movie screen. The movie was still going on with his coat on that was loaded with all of these gimmicks and tricks that he was to use at the beginning of, uh, of the act. And I had it on. I was out there doing the act. And he said right then he feared for, for my well-being I was going to end up in an itinerant magician. And he was right. Well, he was right, but he was almost wrong. You know, I, I have to say, when you mentioned going to boarding school and, and learning the history of magic, you have recently written a book, a tribute to your father you had mentioned, yes. on his 100th birthday. Yes. Um, and uh, called the Blackstone Book of Magic and Illusion. By the way, I thought it was really very interesting. Thank a you. lot about the history of, uh, of magic as well as magic. Well, we cover the 4,500-year history of the art of magic as well as my own family's contribution in that. So this is not just a tribute to my dad, although my motivation for writing it was that the timing of it would come out during his centenary year. And we celebrated that not only with the book, but the International Brotherhood of Magicians made their national conference that year, the Blackstone Conference, and the Smithsonian Institution recognized him with the acceptance of several pieces of his apparatus. And the first, and so far the only, magic apparatus that's been accepted into the, um, the American History Museum portion of the Smithsonian Institution. What is it about that apparatus that makes well, it? Well, uh, two things. First of all, uh, the dancing handkerchief, the Casadega cabinet, which was really my father's tongue-in-cheek recreation of the spiritualism uh, manifestations that were being used in the United States as a sort of a quasi-religion. This we're looking now in the, in the teens and twenties in that period. Um, Casadega, New York, was the head of the American Spiritualist Church. And he did this thing with a borrowed pocket handkerchief where it was supposedly imbued with a 
spirit and it would come to life and dance around and then dance around on the stage and finally be given back to the person in the audience still wiggling. Well, that piece of apparatus and then the light bulb, which was one of the two original floating light globes that my father had that came from the laboratory of Thomas Edison, that one of those two remaining light bulbs was given to the Smithsonian so that it had a double value to it. Aha, uh -huh, so there isn't a, you mean it doesn't really float? Of course and, it really and, floats. And the handkerchief doesn't really do <gasps> We There's something we have to do now, and that's uh, take a break. And then we oh, got to make a buck. And Absolutely. <laughs> I'm going to come back and talk okay. some more. We're with Harry Blackstone. We're here at Trump Plaza Hotel on the boardwalk. We'll be right back after these messages, so please stay right there. You're going to be better than me, Christopher. I can see it in your eyes. No wasting your life on something you hate. Not for my son. You're going to college. I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your eyes. You are going to do something important. Christopher, time for work. We've always had the dreams. Now we have the means. Please, support the United Negro College Fund. If you can't use force to stop a friend from drinking and driving, Hop in. use hey, your wits. This is your car. Yeah. My brother had the same car. He never let me drive it, though. No? So you must have had me in mind when you bought this. Wait till he hears you've got the same one, and you let me drive it, right? OK. Yeah. Take the keys, call a cab, take a stand. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. What is a man? A man stands proud. A man respects himself. A man shares his strength. A man protects his family. If you're a man with a woman who's pregnant, help her get the care she needs now. Because if you don't, for help, just call. We're back. We're with my guest, Harry Blackstone. We're here at Trump Plaza Hotel in Atlantic City. We were talking before the break. Magic is so much a part of your life. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, now today, a professional magician, one of the most famous in the world. Uh, but there was a time when you thought you would not make magic your life's work. There were several times, both before and after I got into magic as a full-time profession. What was it? What were your doubts? My doubts were that being from a family and living under that extremely large mantle of my father, that it would be impossible for me to achieve the kind of not only recognition, but the kind of acceptance that I felt it would be necessary for me to have, and the kind of credit to the industry that he had presented. And therefore, I didn't want to put myself into that kind of competition. And it wasn't until his encouragement and the encouragement of many of my father's peers that gave me the, well, the, the feeling that I could go ahead and at least try to carry on this tradition and the name which he had so brilliantly created. Yes, true. But I, I think, you know, a lot of people think it's easy. Hey, you know, you have a father who's famous, therefore you can go on. I would think that makes it much more difficult. Absolutely. The analogy that I sometimes think of in my own mind, it's like the fact that the name will open the door but somebody has put a spring hinge on that door. And unless you hold it open right, it's going to come back and slap you right in the face. So the ability of being able to do something is not enough. You have to be able to bring credit to the art. And that, hopefully, I've been able to do in these last, oh, I guess, 17 years that I've been in magic on a full-time basis. I spent a long time, 18, almost 19 years, in broadcasting. And I had been working and doing the kind of thing that we're doing today, but on that chair instead of this chair. I was in a small television, radio television operation in Austin, Texas. It was owned by the then Senate Majority Leader, who shall remain nameless, and his wife, Lady Bird. And they gave me the opportunity to start on a full-time basis in broadcasting. I then left there, worked for a while in the Dallas-Fort Worth area, several stations there. Then I went to Chicago and finally out to the West Coast, and then got from the from the on-camera, on-air kind of work into production because I realized that 
that's where the dollars were. And uh, became then part of the Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour on CBS and eventually as associate producer and then as producer of that and produced Tom and Dick Smothers uh, national road tours. In fact, that's how I got back into magic. We were all working at CBS one day and a gentleman came in and said, Tommy, we want to see your tape before it goes out on the air so we can check it because a lot of the uh, people are concerned with your particular comedic approach to the Vietnam War. And Tommy says, I'll deliver it as we always deliver it and if you want to censor it, then that's a breach of contract. Well, they had a little argument about that and 48 hours later, we were all out on the street looking for work. And at that particular time, Tommy happened to be doing a movie, and it was called Get to Know Your Rabbit. It's a cult film. Uh, we call it that because only 250 people ever want to see it, but they like to see it over and over again. And Get to Know Your Rabbit was Brian De Palma's first Hollywood film. And it had Orson Welles and Catherine Ross and uh, John Astin and Alan Garfield and several others in the film with Tommy. He played a tap dancing magician under the tutelage of Orson Welles. Well, I actually created the magic and did all of this for Tommy. And we then went into a Las Vegas hotel for the Christmas season, and Tommy said, wouldn't it be wonderful, Harry, if you and I do magic together on stage? He says, we'll do it like a challenge routine. I'll do the character from the film, and you play Blackstone, and we'll do it. And I said, okay, we'll come up with some kind of a crazy thing. So he had a little box, and he would open it, show it empty, and then he would close it up, and out of it he would pull this stuffed and rather mangled artificial rabbit. And he got a big laugh with it. And he says, okay, now let's see what you can do. So I had this little telephone booth sized cabinet rolled out on stage and it was shown empty. And then out of it, I brought the 28 members of the Caesars Palace Orchestra, the 13 members of the Edwin Hawkins Singers, the Everly Brothers, Leslie Uggams, and then finally Tom and Dick as the Smothers Brothers. And the two characters of Tom and Dick who had been there earlier turn around and it's not them, but it's two girls that had done a, a change on stage and they come out of the cabinet and that was the magic. Well, it was so well received by the audience and by the reviewers that uh, Forrest Duke, the reviewer for the uh, Variety, said, you ought to get back into magic full time. And when he said that, I said, well, Tommy, I think maybe I'm going to get into magic. He says, getting reviews like you did, you'd be foolish not to. And I said, my one problem is I don't have the cash to do it. Expensive to put on a magic show. For instance, the show we have here at the Trump Plaza, this is a show that represents nearly a half million dollars worth of apparatus and preparation. That particular first show, I needed, oh, I guess maybe it was $50,000 to get the show together. And Tommy, personally, co-signed a loan for me at the bank in Los Angeles, and that's where I got the money. And his manager, Ken Cragen, got my first booking at Harris Club at Lake Tahoe, and that's where I began back in Magic. 17 years ago. That's a shame because the Smothers Brothers really went off the air, never really to come back big again. And that's they came back in the ABC show that they did a couple of seasons later, and then they have done a couple of things since. But the, the money that CBS paid them as a result of their particular uh, civil suit was enough to set them for life. Yeah, okay, but and, and it kind of set Harry Blackstone for life on a different road. That's right. Because here Starting you are totally back different. in magic, which is um, you know a very special place to be. I understand that other magicians all across the country have kind of like a fraternity mm -hmm. and uh, are supportive of each other, but I wonder, is there also a rivalry? Do you try and, and keep tricks to yourself? Do you no, not tricks? the rivalry is in uh, our ability or desire at least to achieve a level of notoriety with the general public. That's the rivalry. There is no rivalry as far as the material goes. When you get right down to it, and if you've read the book carefully, you realize that there are only 17 basic scenarios in magic. Everything happens within those. And it doesn't sound like much until you think of the analogy within music. There are really only eight notes in a scale. And the fact that there's not been all of the music composed that there might be, certainly magic having nearly double the number of notes, if you will, that can be combined in different ways, magic is really just in its infancy of creativity. Ah, okay, well, let's talk about how it's growing up okay. after we take a break. I'm speaking with Harry Blackstone. We're here at Trump Plaza on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. We'll be right back after these messages, so please don't go away. Every week for the past four years, Stephanie has read stories to a room full of Savannah, Georgia preschoolers. 
Every week, the look on the children's faces is priceless. The love that Stephanie feels from every child has made her life a whole lot brighter. Even though Stephanie has never even seen their faces. To see how you can help in your community, call the Points of Light Foundation. Do something good. Feel something real. Little boy, you in the wrong place, man. <laughs> <laughs> to Victor, this isn't just a drawing, it's a cry for help. Listen to the children, learn to protect them from drugs and violence. Call now and take a bite out of crime. During the Gulf War, Alongside our full-time troops stood another important group of people, the men and women of the National Guard and Reserve. In fact, they make up over 44% of our nation's defense. It makes you wonder where we would be without them. When your employees need time off to serve, be a hero. Give them the freedom to protect ours. We're back with my guest, Harry Blackstone, here at Trump Casino Hotel in Atlantic City. And uh, spending time with you, and there is so much to talk about as far right. as magic is concerned, but magic is something that's fascinating to all of us. Is it something that you can just pull out of your pocket and just do something? I'll show you can? one very quick thing. You have a minute? Yeah, you bet. Okay. This is a one-minute trick. Here is a, uh, a deck of playing cards. As you can see, it's each and every card is different. Now, I want you to go through here and just Touch one of these cards at random, any one that you wish. This one right here? That okay, one right take here. it out. Okay. That's fine. Now that you've taken that card out, remember earlier we talked about the book that we have down here? I first learned to do magic through my father. And in here we have a, a particular photograph of my father teaching me the very first trick I ever learned. And there's an interesting part in here, if I can just find that page. I often forget where that page is. I probably should have marked this, knowing that I was going to be doing this in the show. Well, anyway, uh, gee, I thought it was right in there. Somebody, Maybe it disappeared. It Magic. must have. I think it floated out of the page. Well, the, the, okay. the, the reason that I mention this is that it's got a, uh, a wonderful picture of my dad showing me how to do a card trick. I know it's right here just before the color section. Okay. You, you have a, uh, let me see, is this one of the first edition books? Oh, this is one that you borrowed from the uh, library. Do you know why I borrowed it from the library? Because my local bookstore had sold all the books. Mm -hmm. The library, I have to tell you, was out of this book for a long time because somebody no took kidding. it out. Well, I anyway, I found the page demand. that I was looking for. Good. It's called uh, Backstage Growing Up uh, with the Company. And here I am doing a picture of a trick with my father in which, can you see that right there? It shows the nine of spades right in there. Now, you've selected a card at random. Yeah. Would you hold I it over there and let them believe. see what this card is? The <laughs> card you selected was the nine of spades right there, which is the same card that was there. You see, this is what I call the nine of spades trick. And I just thought you might enjoy seeing that. You've now been part of history. Isn't that fun? Uh, the, now that's incredible. Mm -hmm. Now that now that makes, you know, in, in terms where we hear people read minds, they, I mean, this was magic. But if you had told me that you were going to read my mind, mm -hmm. I would have believed you. Really? Do you believe that, I mean, there are so many people around that claim to be psychic. Do you believe that that's really true, or is it magic? In my like personal people? opinion, there has never been anybody who claims to be psychic that has ever proved to my satisfaction that they are. In fact, a very dear friend, the amazing Randy, has spent a lifetime and has recently just been properly rewarded by the MacArthur Foundation for his fine work in exposing these rather fraudulent people who claim to be the psychics and the, uh, uh, the people who do these wondrous things, the Yuri Gellers and the Peter Popoffs and these others who uh, are now the subject of his investigation. And I'm glad to say that that organization that Randy heads up and is part of, the Group for the Scientific Investigation of, of Anomalies, or the Group for the Investigation of Scientific Anomalies, that he has proven beyond my question that there is no such thing as that psychic ability. Okay, but there is magic. What you do is real magic. You're here at 
the Trump Casino Hotel right. in Atlantic mm -hmm. City, Trump Plaza Hotel in That's Atlantic right. City. Um, what kind of special illusions uh, will we expect to see here? Well, here or wherever we are in the world, we do always the floating light globe. That's, it's a small light globe that floats out over the audience and back to me on stage, or we can borrow somebody from the audience and invite them to come up on stage and saw them in half, or we can uh, change somebody into a Bengal tiger. I mean, there are all kinds of okay. wonderful... Now, Incidentally, have you ever been sawed in half? Oh, uh, well, <laughs> no, I haven't. Would you like to be? Yes. Would you really? Only if you promise that I get put back together Oh, that again. I can't promise. <laughs> uh, you see, sawing somebody no. in half is an illusion. Putting them back together is a miracle, yeah. and I don't do miracles. Okay, let me tell you something that I mentioned in the introduction. Now, this isn't fair because we only have two minutes left. I mentioned in the introduction that you saw your wife in half, right. uh, mm -hmm. that you shoot her out of a cannon, right. and that you change her into a tiger. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it is incredible. I, I want to be able to talk. First of all, I want to ask, will you come back next week? So that Come we can back talk. Next week? Yes, right. We're getting right here in to. this dressing room so that we can talk about. I want to hold the audience for next week because I want to hear about the sawing in half. All right. And the turning into tiger. But you are you going to do Is, another trick? No, no, you just go ahead and talk. Why I'll, do you have a dollar bill in your hand? Because I was going to give it to you. Wasn't that the agreement <laughs> that if I got to be on your show that I got to pay you a dollar? That's probably not enough <laughs> to be on your show. Is it? <laughs> Really well, I tell oh, you well, what, I'm it? sorry. Then I'll tell you what I'll do. Then you just go ahead and and uh, you're talking about about doing all of that before. See, the dollar bill is is most interesting in that as we then op do that and fold it down like that. When you open it up, as you can see, the dollar bill then becomes much more than that, and then that's much more in keeping with what we have. There's a hundred dollar bill, and you can. Wow. Okay. That. Well, that is is that's a good almost. <laughs> <laughs> that is incredible. That's really how I make my living. That's really, you know, we didn't take our eyes off of you the entire time you did this. You, um, you know, if not by magic, it is going to be magic for me to have you here again next week. But right. will you come back again? I'd Can be delighted we do to. another show? Of course. And talk I'll disappear for a little while and then I'll be back. <laughs> Terrific. Okay, well, thank you very much. Thank we you, will be back and we'll pick up next week. Uh, I, I just, for some reason, I can't leave the show keeping the $100 bill because I can't pay you enough for having us here. I'm returning that. Oh. Thank you very much for being here. I hope that uh, you have enjoyed getting to know Harry Blackstone. Please be with us next week because there is so much more to this incredible man that I would like to be able to share with you and that I would like to be able to share with him. So we hope to see you next week. Good night. Have a good week. I'm Arlene Hurston, and I'm glad that you can be with us this evening because, like magic, last week the time disappeared. My guest was Harry Blackstone, one of the world's most famous magicians. He's with us again tonight to share with us some of his spectacular illusions, like sawing his wife in half, changing her into a tiger, and shooting her out of a cannon. I must say she must be a certainly very trusting wife to let you do all those things. Uh, we're going to speak to Harry Blackstone, get to know about some of his very special illusions and his very special life on the road as a magician. So please stay right there. We'll meet Harry Blackstone right after these messages. We'll be right back.
here's one time it doesn't matter who your neighbor is. Here's the other. Life's too short. Stop the hate. That's my dad, and that's mom. Dad's got an idea, a way to get rid of all the grody garbage that's polluting the world. He's invented a big rocket ship to shoot all the garbage into outer space. Mom's not sure, but dad says his invention will save the world. There's an easier way to save the world. Recycle. For your free recycling action guide, write Recycle. Environmental Defense Fund, 257 Park Avenue South, New York, New York. Hello, I'm Arlene Harrison, and we're here again at the Trump Casino Hotel in Atlantic City with my guest, Harry Blackstone. And uh, like magic, uh, you're back again. Yeah. And uh, it really went so fast, uh, because we did talk in the previous show about your history mm -hmm. growing up in the world of magic with a father who was a famous magician. Um, and you have become, certainly in this gen, even more famous uh, than he was. Well, I think mass media allows that to happen. I can remember one time I had done one of my very first television shows. It was the Kraft Music Hall. And following that, the overnights came in, and my father said to me, Son, I understand a lot of people watched that last night. And I said, Yes, apparently it was 29 million people saw me perform last night. He says, You know, that's more people than saw me perform in a lifetime. There isn't a town that I go into. There isn't an engagement that I do that somebody doesn't come back and say, I saw your dad perform, and I saw him at the uh, Cox Theater in Cincinnati or the whatever theater it might be. To this day, as we sit here, do you realize not a single person has ever come up and said to me, I saw you on the Kraft Music Hall? <laughs> well, you know, because they've seen you so many places. Right. So it's not going to be one specific place. And, and you're right, I hadn't thought of that. Um, you are in a, a, a parallel business, the same business your father was in. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are a lot of parallels in your life, actually. Um, your father had three wives. Yes. You're now married to your third wife. Third and last. Yes, okay. Well, a trusting woman. I mentioned in the introduction, I mean, everybody doesn't allow their husband to do the things that you do. Uh, her name is Gay. Yes. Uh, part of your show. Mm -hmm. um, did you meet through the world of magic? In a sense, yes. I was doing a performance for the Magic Castle in Los Angeles, needed an assistant, and the gentleman in charge of the Magic Castle said, I know just the little girl. She's the one that worked with Orson Welles on the Dean Martin show. She's a gold digger. Well, this very attractive little blonde, she was the one at the other end of the line from Goldie Hawn, who was the tall one at the opposite end. And this little Texas girl comes in and uh, I was a little upset with her because the first couple of days she was there and in rehearsal, she was horsing around and playing and pretending to be Ginger Rogers and all of that, and I fired her. Oh, my goodness. Oh, yes. And she came up to me and said, why did you fire me? And I said, because you're kidding around all the time. I said, magic is a serious business. She says, you can't fire me. I said, why not? She says, I'm good. And I said, well, then prove it. Well, she got into some of those illusions, and she did some incredible things. Later became my choreographer. In fact, when we did our first show going up to Lake Tahoe, she choreographed the show for me up there, and I realized at the end of that six-week engagement that I had not negotiated a choreographer's contract with her, only the performing contract. So I negotiated with her, or at least got into negotiations with her, and I found out that it was cheaper to marry her than it was to pay her, so she became my wife. Okay, well, that's not really the reason. I mean, that's another illusion. No, that's reality. <laughs> that you, yeah, oh, you see, yes. when I found out she was a gold digger, I've later found out she still is, but don't you tell her I said that. <laughs> okay, listen, this magic is... Uh, 
this marriage is really working out. Wonderful. Uh, you were married twice before. Yes. And um, you travel so much. Being right. in the world of magic is not an easy life, even though it's, it's fun and exciting. I don't think but any itinerant life, any traveling life is an easy life. Is that why, do you think, the I think first so. two marriages didn't work? Uh, well, the first marriage worked quite well, but uh, she unfortunately suffered from a brain aneurysm, and uh, I lost her shortly after our first two children were born. Um, I remarried perhaps too hastily, uh, and my second wife, who was still living happily in uh, Northern California, and uh, Gay and I met, as I say, as part of this show, and she gave me not only the help that I needed on stage, but the motivation and the, the kind of love and support that I needed to go into this new phase of my life, which was into magic on a full-time basis. We had married shortly before it was necessary for me to do that. I had been working in television up to that time and had to change careers. Uh, it was either that or spend a lot of time in the unemployment line. So we got into magic and she was a wonderful helpmate and she's very knowledgeable both as a performer and as a producer. And she was a great help to me and has been my co-producer now all the way through not only of the show but also now of our family because we have a six-year-old daughter. Yes, her name is Bellamy. Bellamy. I understand. Now, you just, I, I read in uh, Weight Watchers magazine, of all yes. there was an article on you and, and your wife and your daughter. Right. It said in that magazine that you and Bellamy have hypoglycemia. Yes. And that gay is also borderline. Now, in the kind of business you do, illusions, magic, and you're going to do some magic tricks for us here today, sure. too, but you have to be very alert at that time. With hypoglycemia, you can faint, you can be nauseous, dizziness. Mm -hmm. How right. do you deal with that and being on the road? Well, we try to take good care of ourselves. Um, my hypoglycemia has tended to become less and less severe with age. Uh, my daughter's now is still quite, um, quite severe. And we find that through proper diet and the anticipation of what her needs will be with high protein intake, that sort of thing, we're able to give her the kind of balanced food intake keep her away from the heavy sweets and all of those things normally that uh, parents would like to do, but it, she understands and appreciates that it is a problem for her and that it is really a change in her personality and in her ability to cope with things that um, she willingly then follows our dietary suggestions. Well, it's, it kind of all forces you to unheard be... Unheard of for a six-year-old. Ah, yes, true. <laughs> but you've never had a problem on stage? Of, of uh, not recently. I had some problems, oh, maybe 15, 20 years ago. If I would not properly watch my diet, I would get severe migraine-type headaches. And they were debilitating. And I missed two performances. And the only two performances I have ever missed in my career, knock on plastic, <laughs> that uh, I missed were due to this uh, irregulation of my diet. Nowadays, we know what the problem is. We anticipate. <laughs> right, okay. And go on from there yes. into, uh, in some, into some wonderful and exciting things in your life that we're going to talk about and in your show okay. that we're going to talk about after we come back from this commercial break. All right. We're speaking with Harry Blackstone. We're here at Trump Plaza Hotel in Atlantic City. We'll be right back after these messages, so please stay right there. Christopher, I can see it in your eyes. No wasting your life on something you hate. Not for my son. Yeah, you're going to college. I can see it in your eyes. I can see it in your eyes. You are going to do something important. Christopher, time for work. We've always had the dreams. Now we have the means. Please, support the United Negro College Fund. If you can't use force to stop a friend from drinking and driving, Hop in. use hey, your wits. This is your car. Yeah. My brother had the same car. He never let me drive it, though. No? So you must have had me in mind when you bought this. Wait till he hears you've got the same one, and you let me drive it, right? OK. Yeah. Take the keys, call a cab, take a stand. Friends don't let friends drive drunk. What is a man? A man stands proud. A man respects himself. A man shares his strength. 
a man protects his family. If you're a man with a woman who's pregnant, help her get the care she needs now. Because if you don't, for help, just call. We're back with my guest, Harry Blackstone. We're here at Trump Plaza Hotel on the boardwalk in Atlantic City. Nice place to be and nice to be here with you. But uh, when you're on stage, now we talked about this in the introduction a little bit. Uh, when you're on stage, some of the things that you do um, are saw your wife in half, mm -hmm. turn her into a tiger, shoot her out of a cannon. That's not part of our current show. The cannon is not. We do the other things now. The cannon will happen in a show that we're doing a little later this season. Um, you see, it depends on how she's loaded into the cannon as to how successful that becomes. And there are times when, let's say, she's not a girl of the same caliber. So right now she's not being shot out. What do you mean, and not a girl of the same caliber? Well, the, that's what you call the diameter of the cannon. Ah. And so it's very specific, because it's a very dangerous piece to do. And uh, because she's been, uh, she was injured about, um, oh, now about two months ago, her leg was hurt while we were on tour in China. And because it requires perfect physical ability for her to do that, we don't take a chance and put her into those things. So for a moment, she has a respite from that moment, but we put in a couple of other even more dangerous things for her to do that don't require the legs so much. Okay, now that's what I want to talk about. You know, first she has to be in great shape. She, she has is. to stay thin. Yeah. Uh, when you are sawing her in half, mm -hmm. it's a 36 inch electric buzz saw. That's right. Now, I mean, Powered by a 20 horsepower motor. And may I point out, it's done in full view of the audience. She's not put inside of a box or she's not uh, hidden away. In fact, on our book, there is a, a photograph of her being sawed in half. And that blade right there is solid steel. And she is laying out in full view of the audience. And this is exactly what you'll see on our stage tonight or at any other performance. Okay, now that is incredible. In seeing the pictures yes. of it, in seeing it done, now she looks very happy when you're doing it. Now, uh, you tell me that's an illusion. It looks real to me, but is it really dangerous? I mean, very. Is it, can you really, by mistake, really saw her in half? If, well, if it, it ever happens, I'll say it was a mistake. <laughs> well, you know what I mean. Is it really dangerous? It is. It's lethal. And in fact, I caution the young people in my audience never to attempt to do this sort of thing. It is a theatrical illusion. But it's done in such a way and with such reality and realism that um, people believe that uh, we've had people faint in the audience. We've had to carry them out, uh, uh, not the least of whom was my wife's mother when she saw it a number of years ago. I would understand that. <laughs> and she and uh, Mrs. Blevins is her name. And uh, she and our daughter, Bellamy, often sit in the audience. And when it comes to that time, Ina Blevins puts her hands over her eyes and does not watch and has not watched that. Yeah, interesting, but the daughter always comes back. Well, in, hopefully. In so far, so good. Is there real danger on yes. the stage in Magic? Yes. What's the danger? Well, not only with the props, but just being on stage can be dangerous. We were recently in Detroit, Michigan, and a piece of apparatus that we had hung overhead for use later on in the show broke its moorings and came crashing down on my wife, dislocated her shoulder, broke her bridge of her nose and um, uh, did some slight damage to her spine. Uh, I have fallen off of the edge of the stage and I've broken both of my uh, uh, knees in falling on that in years past. Uh, I've had crates fall on me. Uh, I have a, uh, a broken finger, as you can see right here, where this finger got snapped back while uh, working with one of the large animals. We used to have a, an Asian elephant in our show. And uh, she, had just in playing with me, was uh, swinging her trunk around. It caught the end of my finger and broke it right on back. I mean, these are some of the dangers of it. But even more dangerous is uh, going into a place where you have a, uh, a producer or an agent that uh, is there. They can be the most dangerous of all. <laughs> okay, but that's a different kind of danger. <laughs> when you mention an elephant, I yes. mean, you travel with elephants, with tigers, right. with doves, um, with rabbits. Rabbits, of okay. Tw a staff of 29 mm -hmm. people. 
how do you get them all together? I mean, that that's a, you call them up and say you're going to yeah. be here and there at that particular time. No, but I mean, in 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 Cardiff, do you have an elephant in or a tiger? Certainly yes. in in the show here yes. at Trump Plaza. Mm -hmm. So you must travel all the time with elephants, tigers, and mm -hmm. uh, well, the elephant right now is on summer vacation. Oh, uh, she is in Chicago. No, quite frankly, she is. She, uh, you find that certain animals reach a saturation point, and they just become tired of working. They're not like people. They have the good sense to stop. And she's now taking a few months off, and she'll be back in the show then in the fall. And when we return to Atlantic City the next time, we'll probably have camels and an elephant and uh, other animals that have not been on our show over the last couple of times. <laughs> we trade them around. Okay, where are they now, today? At the moment, uh, the elephant is in Chicago. The camels, the other three tigers, the lion, the black leopard, the donkeys, the other things are in Tehachapi, California. That's a community a little north of uh, Los Angeles where they're part of a compound and are used in motion picture work or used just to graze. And uh, two of the animals are involved in a breeding program right now. See, it's not all work. Okay, so, uh, good, I'm glad they're, they're having some fun. Sometimes you bring people up from the audience. Yes. Um, now, that can be dangerous in another way. Has it ever been embarrassing? Oh, sure. That happens sometimes. We get people up there who come up because they think they want to be the star of the show. Well, there are ways to lightheartedly take care of that, and I've learned after years and years of working in the casinos and saloons and theaters that I've worked in, you learn the ways to handle people. And you do it in a way so that it doesn't embarrass them first. And secondly, it does it in a way that it doesn't destroy the flow of the program. There hasn't been a situation you couldn't handle, or one in particular that stands out? Well, one, I can remember recently, we were in Vancouver, part of Expo 86, and a fellow came up on stage, and he was really, I think, had had too much uh, of the uh, grape before coming up on stage. And he just kept hollering and screaming and singing and carry on. And I said, obviously, you're a musician. And he said, yeah, I'm a great musician. I said, well, OK, why don't you play a song for us? And they had a piano out there because the orchestra was behind it. I said, you sit right down at the piano. So he sat down at the piano. The curtains closed in front of the piano. There was a muffled roar. The curtains reopened, and he was gone. Of course, the stagehands and the security people got him backstage. And he wasn't seen or heard from again until they got him outside of the theater. So there are ways to... in from an audience standpoint, not embarrassing somebody. I didn't want to hurt him or that. And if it worse comes to worse, I can always turn him into a rabbit. Uh -huh. Okay, that's another kind of magic. We're going to do something that's not magical but necessary right now, and that's uh, take another break, and okay. then we'll come back and talk some more. And then hopefully uh, you'll do some magic. I'd be delighted to. I have a special trick just for you. Okay, well, we're going to see it when we come back. We're speaking with Harry Blackstone. We're here at Trump Plaza in Atlantic City. We'll be right back after these messages, so please stay right there. Every week for the past four years, Stephanie has read stories to a room full of Savannah, Georgia preschoolers. Every week, the look on the children's faces is priceless. The love that Stephanie feels from every child has made her life a whole lot brighter. Even though Stephanie has never even seen their faces. To see how you can help in your community, call the Points of Light Foundation. Do something good. Feel something real. To Victor, this isn't just a drawing, it's a cry for help. Listen to the children. Learn to protect them from drugs and violence. Call now and take a bite out of crime. During the Gulf War, alongside our full-time troops stood another important group of people, the men and women of the National Guard and Reserve. In fact, they make up over 44% of our nation's defense. It makes you wonder where we would be without them. When your employees need time off to serve, be a hero. Give them the freedom to protect ours. Boy, I really did it last night. Got drunk, acted stupid, went home with... with... Who is that? What, am I stupid? How did I do this? Barry began to worry, really worry. 
What about AIDS? Then he remembered, hey, I'm just a cartoon. I don't even have to shower. Get high, get stupid, get AIDS. Hello, and welcome back to the Harry Blackstone Show. My guest today is Arlene Hurst. Oh, I'm <laughs> kidding. I used to do that, you know, years I ago. Know, I got a surprise I like for you. Arlene, I have a prediction right here, and I want our friends at home to know that there's been no prearrangement. As you can tell, there's no rehearsal in this show. I want you to take this. I have predicted on there the name of a playing card. Don't look at it yet, because I want you to name the first card that comes to your mind, and the name of that playing card is there upon that piece of paper. Wouldn't that be amazing? That would be absolutely amazing. Since and please know that there is no prearrangement because I, we wouldn't do that. Absolutely, I guarantee that. Okay. okay, say the name of the card. Two of hearts. Okay. Would you open that up, please? Okay, now show the oh. folks at home exactly what it says. It says here, the name of the card you selected is John. Now, Yes. okay. Do you make any that, sense that out of that? That says John. Well, no, I selected the two of hearts. No, no, um, I said <gasps> I... the name of the playing card. Like, your name is Arlene, my name uh, is Harry. I have uh, my deck of cards right in here, and if I can, can show you uh, right here that uh, you said the two of hearts, was it? Two uh, of hearts. Two of hearts. I know the two of hearts is in here. So there's a two of hearts right there. And would you just hold on to that for just a moment right there? You see, playing cards like people have names. For instance, um, it could have been Lou or Jay, or Pat, or Tina, or Paula. You see, each one of these playing cards has a name on it. And I said, and I would predict, that the name of your playing card would be John. And as you see, the two of hearts is named John. The name of my playing that card is, is the name John. of your playing card. So if you ever see the two of hearts, you'll say, hello, John. <laughs> Terrific. Okay? And then we get rid of it like that, you see? So that. <laughs> So that it's really magic. It really is. And if you believe that, I got some swampland in Florida I'd like to talk to you about. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Now, now, you did that earlier. You know, in, in the show that we did last week, you took a $1 bill. I, mm -hmm. I watched every minute you turned it into a $100 bill. Yes. Um, it's an illusion. It's not real. It's partially sleight of hand, but what it is is applied psychology. I get to learn how to make you watch the left hand while the right hand does the dirty work. You see? That's what it's all about. So in order to be a magician, in mm -hmm. order to be a professional magician, what would be the, the most important in, ingredient? The use of your hands? The use of your mind? The mind first, of course. I think that you have to learn about people. And then the manual dexterity that's required is something that anybody can do. In fact, there's nothing that I have done here or that I'll do on stage here at the Trump Plaza or wherever I might be working that could not be done by any 10-year-old child with 15 years practice. <laughs> well, okay. Um, obviously, so it can't be done by a 10-year-old child. You have some more tricks for us. I do indeed. You do. You I have one special thing. I have, this is my, uh, my special card. It's called my big card trick, my big finish. Uh, I see you have a clipboard right there with your name on it. I That's was correct. Very nice, uh, nice to know that. That way, in it's case you can't John. remember who you are, um, I'll place this right down there just for a moment, so that that's there, and that is kind of a uh, prediction. Just set it right down for a moment, and I'll I'll get my uh, deck of playing cards back out and hand this deck of cards to you. Do you shuffle cards? Sure. Okay. First of all, examine the deck. See that it's an ordinary deck. Okay, on both sides. Both sides. The both fronts sides. are all yeah. different, and the backs are all the same. You Absolutely. See, a deck of cards is kind of like a chorus line. Oh. Now, Think about it. Now, <laughs> shuffle them up so they're not in any prearranged order. Okay. Oh, I can see this is part of a misspent uh -huh. youth. Huh? <laughs> As a matter of fact, now, at learned. random now, then you can see by looking at the other side that each and every card is different. So I had no idea of knowing. If I had the same card time after time, it would not be uh, fair to do that kind of thing. So what I'm going to do instead is to ask you just to select one of these cards out of the deck and, and hold on to it at random. Okay? Take one of them out. Take it out. Okay, now you have one card there. Look at that card. Let the folks at home see what it is. I won't peek. Okay? Okay. Let the folks at home That's see what it folks is. At home. Now remember before we started all of this, I handed you a rather large card. True. And this is called the sympathetic card trick. I'm going to change the value of the card that you are holding there to equal the value of the card that you have just selected at random from this deck. Now we do that, and the card is changed. Would you look at the very large card now? And you see that that is the six of diamonds, and the other one was the six I of will, diamonds. That is incredible. And that is what I call my sympathetic card trick. Are you sympathetic to my plight? 
Well, I have to say I'm very impressed. <laughs> I can't. Sympathetic is that. Now, that's incredible because you had no way of knowing. To know Unless that would be a, a deck of all six of diamonds. And if it were, then that would be cheating. That's why I made True. it a point of asking you to check that each and every card is different. You see, otherwise, it, uh, it would be different. For instance, I'll put the six of, little six of diamonds back into the deck as we do that. Or you can keep it as a souvenir if you wish. I don't <laughs> care which one. Oh, what happened? Oh, my goodness. It changes the three of hearts. Oh, well, you see, that can happen, too. <laughs> Okay, I'll return that to you. Thank you. Now, here at Trump Plaza yes. Hotel um, on the boardwalk in Atlantic City, you had on Broadway um, your own show for yes. a long time. I mean, really incredible. Um, actually, I wish we could do magic and stretch the time because I just learned we only have something like 30 seconds left. Really? But that was probably, having your show on Broadway was probably one of your dreams come it true. Was. Are there other dreams? Are there other things that... Yes, and they're just coming to realization. We're beginning in the early part of 1987, a world tour, which will start in London, and we will end up in Australia after going all through Europe and into parts of China and the Far East. With so, your magic. With our magic. So perhaps when I come back from all of that, I can show you a whole new slant on magic. That would be terrific. Now, is it an illusion? You seem so happy in your life, in your personal life, um, on stage. It's no illusion. That's the reality. Well, I'm glad we had the reality of you being on my show, not just once, but twice. And Arlene, I thank you very my much. Pleasure. My pleasure, too. Thank you. I hope that you have enjoyed getting to know Harry Blackstone, and I hope that you'll be here again next week. Meantime, good night. Have a good week.